Well, good morning and welcome again to Word for the Week, our online book study series here at Cornerstone Faith Community Church. My name is Jeremy Heidkem. I'm glad to be with you for this week's study. Uh, this week, we are um, still in uh, J. Payleitner's book, The Prayer of Agar, but we are looking at uh, chapters 12 and 13 today. Um, chapter 12 being list number 4, 13 being list 5, and list number 4, Payleitner has titled Small Wonders. List 5, he has titled The Downfall of Kings. Um, what's interesting about uh, both of these lists, in my opinion, is that and there is a um, like an oversight or or a misunderstanding or a um, uh, something that folks often miss uh, about both of these things. Let me explain what I mean. In the first list, list number four, it's all about small wonders. He talks about ants, hyraxes, uh, locusts, and lizards. Now. Um, we're going to talk a little bit more about each of those categories in a second, but I think the thing that's so often uh, missed or overlooked or, or, or not seen clearly enough about these small wonders is that though they are small, they have been given by God an incredible amount of power. I'm going to call it power in some way. Now, in, in some instances, I'm not talking about power as in like, uh, let's say an ox that has power to pull a, a, a cart or move a millstone, but they're given a certain sort of power, um, a certain sort of knowledge, um, opportunity, however you want to label it. Um, and when people look at these small wonders, oftentimes they don't necessarily see that up front. They don't think about um, what these little wonders have been given. The interesting thing about list five with the downfall of kings and the thing that is overlooked, I think, is that people often look at kings and they just think uh, authority, power, um, success. The truth is, though, right? There are there are a whole host of kings in the world that are that were not successes, that were terrible failures in history. Um, and we might even say there are kings or authorities in our world today that are terrible failures. They're in a place of authority and power, and people, I suppose, respect or revere them because of the place they're in but they're not successful. And so there's this oversight, right? When you have the small, the, the small creatures of the world, people look at them and say that they're weak, but they might be mighty, they might be strong. Uh, they're usually strong. People look at kings and they go, oh, they're powerful, but they might be not powerful. They might be weak and, and unsuccessful. And so um, the problem with both of, both of these lists is that there's this sort of oversight. Now. Before we go any further, I want to suggest that that applies to us as Christians because I think uh, that the world looks at Christians, uh, believers, and and has these sort of um, oversights or these misconceptions. And so what ends up happening is people say, oh, that person is a Christian, that person is a believer, and so they um, absolutely 100% do these things, they think these things, they say the, these things, they expect these things. Now, those might be true and they might not be true. Um, and, and at the same time, um, someone professes themselves to be a believer. And so people will say, oh, because you're a believer, uh, you know, you are, uh, you pray a lot, you read the Bible, you trust God, you, you know, whatever it is. But just because a person says they're a believer doesn't necessarily mean that that is 100% always true. And so uh, what I want to look at today are these sort of misconceptions, okay? Look at list number four. It says small wonders. It says uh, four things are small on earth, yet they are extremely wise. Ants are creatures of little strength, yet they store up food in the summer. Hyraxes are creatures of little power, yet they make their home in the crags. Locusts have no king, yet they advance together in ranks. And a lizard can be taught, can be caught with the hand, yet it's found in king's palaces. And so, uh, interesting little oversights, right? The ant, it's so small, yet it can it can build up food in in, in storage enough for the entire winter. Um, you know, uh, it has been said that when um, when folks uh, came to the United States. Uh, very, very, very early on, it, 
maybe it wasn't the United States necessarily came to the colonies, came uh, here, whatever. Uh, as we moved westward and folks started to move into places like the Midwest or the Western states, and they had to become pioneers. They had to uh, create farms, make an existence for themselves. Um, it's often been said that um, uh, the, the, the greatest uh, point of success for pioneers was the ability uh, to grow food, right, for themselves, provide food that they don't have to necessarily go out and hunt, like vegetables and fruits and whatever else, but uh, to grow food and to be able to then preserve or store that food. And so canning, for instance, for vegetables or drying uh, for spices and some kinds of vegetables, um, root vegetables, storing them in you know cold places like root cellars, um, these things were the key success moments for pioneers. Well, how did we learn that? How did we know that we could potentially uh, have this opportunity to store up food and not have to be out hunting or gathering um, when the elements are, are bad? I think, I would imagine, that we looked at the rest of creation and said, this is what the animals do, why can't we do it? And so we start to gather in things. now. Uh, obviously before refrigeration and other kinds of storage, uh, canning, that kind of thing, uh, we would gather the things that we knew would last over time, right? But then people say, well, I want to have peaches in the middle of the winter. How can I keep peaches from going bad? And so we, we learned how to preserve things. And so there's this idea that um, the ants, though they're, they're tiny, they can carry, the book says, up to 5,000 times their weight. And so they bring all of this food into storage so that no one goes hungry over the winter. You look at an ant, you, you wouldn't necessarily think of that initially, right? The, the hyrax, which apparently is sort of like a, a rock badger, it, it discovers that it needs a safe place. And, and so it crawls into the little uh, cavities or the little cracks in, uh, in mountains and cliffs, and it builds a home there. Uh, each of these small uh, instances of God's creation has something amazing about it. So what do we learn from that? Well, we've often heard the phrase, we're small but mighty. Uh, can't, I can't agree with that anymore. I mean, we are, even here at, at Cornerstone Faith Community Church, this is such a true statement. We, we are small, but we are mighty. We have uh, an incredible core group of people we have uh, people who are, are passionate and growing. Uh, and so we may be small from the outside. When people look at us from the outside, they go, it's just a small place, not a lot of people, but we have a lot of strength here. Um, and it's an incredible thing. Um, you know, in God's word, we hear about uh, um, so many different uh, times where we hear about the weak becoming strong, uh, the, the poor becoming rich, the first being last, you know, these kind of misconceptions. People look at one thing, if you're weak, you're weak, you can't be strong. But the Bible says the weak are the ones who are strong, right? And I'm, I'm, I remember, uh, or I'm drawn to the passage that tells us, you know, that there are some in this world who trust in things like horses and chariots and uh, kings and all of their powers. But the Word of God tells us that those who really truly have strength, those who trust um, God, they really have strength. And so it says, you know, there are some who trust in the horses, the chariots, but we trust in the Lord our God. Um, pretty, pretty incredible because I think people uh, overlook this concept. Uh, in list five, it talks about the downfall of kings. And uh, we've talked about this before, but the downfall of every great king is himself. Okay. Um, it, it, yes, there are, there are countless numbers of, of instances in history where another country or another nation has come in and, and taken over a, a kingdom, killed a king, whatever. Yes, maybe that king was uh, downfall was someone else coming in. But the reality is we can look back and say, well, how did those people get in? And so to some degree, we always say that, that, that a king's greatest downfall is himself, right? Um, and, and, and here's how that oftentimes happens. Uh, when folks like kings or rulers or powers or authorities 
when they become prideful, when they uh, trust um, in their own strengths, their own abilities above every other thing. The reality of this life in this world is that we're always going to need the help of someone. Um, there will come a moment in every life where we, our own ability isn't enough. We need help. Now, kings, right, they're supposed to be strong and powerful and mighty. They don't want to ask for help. And, and oftentimes, neither do you or I. And so what happens is our pride gets in the way. Uh, the Word of God tells us that pride goes before the fall, right? Uh, and so when pride gets in the way, we end up falling. What's interesting about that, right, is that when we think about this misconception or this, this misunderstanding, people look at a king and they think pride, right? They think that king is strong. Uh, he's, he's got this wonderful kingdom, so on and so forth. And if, you're a, if you live in that kingdom, if you're a citizen of that kingdom, you may have pride in your king pride in your country we do this in the united states we have an incredible pride in our country but there have been moments where our downfall as a country has been our pride in ourselves we haven't thought about others we haven't thought about our need of help and so uh, we're always going to find situations in our lives where there's a problem with pride um, here's the, the basic gist of this whole thing. Whether we're talking about any one of the lists, we're talking about Agar's prayer uh, to keep him away from, you know, um, pride, from, from, from lies, from evil ways, those kinds of things. Uh, the, the, the purpose of this, remember, is we're trying to find the sweet spot with God. And I would argue that the sweet spot with God um, it is not focused on weaknesses. It's not focused on how big or how small. It's not focused on how strong or how weak. It's not focused on any of those things. It's focused on the fact that everyone has the same opportunity to have strength and wisdom and power if we'll simply trust God. doesn't matter how small. Uh, one of my favorite passages of Scripture was about Bethlehem, where Jesus was born. And Isaiah promises, but you, Bethlehem, Ephrathah, smallest among the nations, out of you will come the one who will be uh, the king for Israel, the Messiah, the Savior. So here's Bethlehem, this small nation that everyone's like, well, what's Bethlehem? Nothing ever comes out of Bethlehem. And here comes the Savior of the whole world. When we trust God, we have that kind of access to power, that kind of access to strength, that kind of access to ability, to wisdom, whatever it is we need. And so don't be, don't have a misconception. Don't misunderstand this, right? Um, we might seem weak or small or insignificant in the grand scheme of all that God's creation is. But when we trust him fully, we have his power, we have his name, and we will be strong because he has the ability to make us strong. I hope you guys have a great week this week, and I look forward to meeting with you again next week. Have a great week.